I just want to say how happy I am. It's just amazing to walk around here during this coffee break and look at all you people who are gathered here today, see that someone from UK that I maybe met many times speaking with, our, with one of our family homes and it's such a lovely mix of people here and see how you all connect to each other. That makes me really, really happy. And now I want to welcome Volkmar Aderholt from Germany. He is a person that knows most of the up-to-date research in this area. Welcome. Thanks, um, Karina, for, for this invitation. You insisted and I, uh, I, I, it was very nice to be here so far. I don't know whether it's nice to talk here so far. I mean, let's see. So... Um, just a short introduction. Ten years ago, I started as a normal psychiatrist uh, in, a, in a university clinic. I started to read, truly to read studies, full text studies, not abstracts. And I was shocked. And then I decided to confront the system with their own evidence. So in a way, I present their evidence. You can get these slides. And if you write an email to me, you get all the full texts you want to have for free. So, so read. Um, my, so if you are interested, read. Read the whole thing, not only the headlines. So that's it. You will find a lot. And it started to be a criminal, like a criminal story. And then I read Peter Goetsch's books and I thought, ah, oh, that's about a criminal story. But that came later. So now I start. I, I want to talk about the brain, and there are two areas I want to talk about. The first one is the one in the middle. The, this is what they call the striatum. It's not important, just to give you a short idea where we move in, within the brain. And then finally in the, about the frontal lobe. And um, some is now a, a little repetition because uh, Bob said already, here you see we have substrates of psychotic phenomena, and the one we know, there are many, but the one we know and we try to influence is this uh, hyper activity of the dopamine system in this little area in the brain in the middle. And there you have this presynaptic increased dopamine release. This is if you have symptoms, if you have psychotic phenomena. Not much, but some. It's not outrageous. And this is seen as the final common pathway, as a substrate of people who are in psychotic states. But it's not the cause, it's a pathway. It's a psychophysiological pathway or a physiological pathway. And it's, they call this phasic sensitization because it's not always there. It's only there once people are in psychotic states. If they remit or it, it, if it, stops self-limitating, this, this will not be there anymore. We don't know why. And we know from long-term outcome studies, even schizophrenia is in many times episodic, self-limiting, before they invented neuroleptics. Other diseases, illnesses are much more. Just short, just read this list because if you might think the cause in the brain is the brain, you are wrong. The brain reacts and here we, we don't know about all this genetical stuff. We saw this little kind of effect sizes uh, uh, from um, in the beginning. And, and here you see others which are risk factors. And you see environment is involved in the brain. I don't go through them. But I want to hit and uh, point out the sexual and physical trauma became a high debate and um, John will pick it up, certainly. And there are more social factors, which are these. No. I just want to give it to you as if we talk about the brain, we talk about people's life and environment. And the dopamine system, because it reacts. So now we are talking about the medication the so-called medication, 
And here you see, this is from a, 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 a script from a psychoeducative material. You see pills are coming in through the blood into the brain and they put themselves here on these postsynaptic dopamine receptors. Postsynaptic dopamine receptor blockade. They are dopamine blockers. They do it there, but they do it also in other areas, which we don't like them to do. So they are not curative because they don't heal the problem. They just filter the problem. Downstream, they call this. This is from a, a neurobiological basic researcher. And they described what they can do on the dopamine receptor with this salience. This is this meaning making in psychosis. Maybe you just read it. I don't have to talk so much. This is basic neuroscience. This is not a nasty antipsychiatric uh, <laughs> agitator. Um, so people think of this. What are we doing? So we block a system which has to be there, which we need, and we should not overdo. And we do know now it's a blockage of 60 to 70 percent of these receptors. More is bad. And to be short, here you see if we go more than 70, this is what we get. It's, there's a threshold. If we keep the 70 percent, we could close to avoid all these side effects. I don't explain it because I want to move you through these problems. You know, see, they are all over 70. If we could titrate, we could make it. And oh, so dose, I, I work very much with dosages because this is what you can influence in psychiatry the most easy, the easiest, in the easiest way. Keep the dosages low. And here you see what we can also, what we have in our hand if we use higher or lower dosages. This is a major catastrophe in people's life that shortens their life. And now I go for what, for this long-term effects. You know, blockade is nice. It's the first days, so they are there and they block, but they do more. And we heard this already because the brain is neuroplastic. The brain adapts. And this is from another basic neuroscience researcher from Mrs. Samaha. And that's what she, uh, what she um, designed. It's such a nice picture. Take this one. Um, not nice what she says, but the picture. Here you see this is a neuro antipsychotic naive subject in a psychotic state. Receptors. And here you can count one, two, three, four. And this is the high state dopamine receptor. He has a different configuration and he sucks in more dopamine. And here you see antipsychotic treated subjects, same amount here, presynaptic, but here you see they double the amount, up regulation, that's what we heard so far, and more of them are in a high dopamine, high state, three. They, it's kind of threefold increase. So what we have in the short or long term, if we use dopamine blockers, we have this up regulation. And you see by 30%, and if you do it for years, 70 to 100%. And this super sensitization, this is up to threefold. And here is a red research from Seaman. He's a major dopamine researcher in the field. And you see, if you give quetiapine, you get more of these increased dopamine receptors if you give olanzapine, haloperidol, if you give clotzeril, but also if you give phenylcyclidine, PCP, the, if you amphetamine, so if you give drugs or neuroleptics, they all do this D2 receptor high state increase. <laughs> and they do this, this is also important, they do this dose dependent. If you lose use low dosages, they do it less. If you do higher dosages, they do it more. Upregulation and sensitization. So we also have this in our hand. So what is the result? 
So once they start to upregulate, you need higher dosages. We normally double the dosages in, in the medium term. The, the effectivity is decreasing. They don't do, work so, bad, so good as in the beginning. You get rebound phenomena if you withdraw or reduce. And if you take them off from one day to the other, you have a threefold increase, up to threefold increase of relapses. And if you have a new relapse, the positive and negative symptoms are higher. They increase. And the intervals between two episodes, even being on medication, get shorter. We had this relapse rates under norleptics. And supersensitive psychosis means that you can get psychotic even taking your pills. If you go to a doctor and says, I took my pills, but I'm crazy, he would not believe that you took your pills. What can you do? Someone mentioned this. Um, Birgitta said, this young man who took the pill once a week. He was right, and he might also have a little effect. It's not only homeopathy, because the brain can readjust if you give it time. So they did studies that if you do it every second day, the, this receptor can a bit reset to the ordinary, not, not totally. And if you do it every third day, he can do it even then. So there are only three studies, only short term. We would like to have more, we don't get them, but you could try. And all studies, you could prolong the intervals of depot neuroleptics from two to four weeks works as well. From two to six weeks works as well. Studies from 1999. Do we do this? No. So all in uh, one of the big field in psychosis is heterogeneity. They are so different and we don't know why. And here is an old um, overview done by Hefner. He's a very influential German, maybe one of the most influential German in the last century. Uh, and here you see long-term outcome studies done before the introduction of neuroleptics. At least not more than 5% of them had been medicated. And you see in more, if you would count all these numbers and look for these red fields with healing and uh, kind of diminished symptoms, you would see it's over, always over 50%, 60% before the introduction of neuroleptics. So that's the, that's the normal natural course. And it's unpredictable in a way. There's every pattern, each pattern go, can go into everything. So this is where we work in, in a very heterogeneous group of people. We don't know why they are like this. And that's what the neuroleptics do. And this is a study done for, with 500 people, N is the total number, first episode people, treated over six months. This is long enough to see whatever, if this drug works or what it does. And you see only 32% of them had a good in decrease of their symptoms. PANS is a measure, is an instrument to measure symptoms, and they decrease fair good. This is what you like, being a, being a shrink. And the people, they take, they take their medication, because most of them, because they feel they work. And, but even in first episodes, all the rest of the people, they have a decrease which is below clinical significance. So a fifth of the symptoms, doesn't make a clinical visible difference. And people don't take their medication here. They start stopping them because they feel they have other reasons to do it. But one of them is because they feel they don't work. And they are right. Here you see the same picture. And please look at these lines. You know, they keep themselves on the same level after they started to, to have their first effect in the first four weeks, and after the first four weeks, nothing more is coming. 
So what you don't get in the first four weeks, you won't get it later. So what happens? Uh, here are people who had been treated for 17 years, illness duration, kind of treatment duration maybe, and you can see in 80% of these cases, this line is much, much softer. <coughs> and there is only 12% where this line keeps this amount of decrease and all the rest is much weaker. So they lose their effectivity. The reduction of symptoms is much less. Next step, crazy. This is a study called Katie's study, which was the most influential non-industrial funded study done in, the, in America. This uh, kind of ruined the myth of second generation antipsychotics, so-called atypicals. This is a late outcome done by Mrs. Mr. Levine, and they looked for the effectivity of symptoms under neuroleptics. There, this was not an acute treatment. They put people on different drugs being stable, semi-stable. So, and this is what you get. People who, only the people who were on perfenacine, or this is an old one, or lanzapine, this is a new drug, they became better. Down means better, but then they lost this better, up to 5%. And the others became worse under the drugs. Constantly worse. And these were the completers, which were just 30% of the people, the rest, they dropped their medication within one and a half year. And so you see, if, even if you take your drugs, you get worse. This is what we heard so far from this Harrow study, which Bob presented already. And now look at the dropouts. They were the ones not to take it to the bitter end. And they are normally the ones who have a less effectivity of drugs because they drop it. I said, I showed this from the first episode study, and here they deteriorate under the neuroleptics in a public funded study, the biggest ever done study in the United States, and they decrease. And they decrease in different rates. And here you see this strong deterioration is only 12%, but they deteriorate under the neuroleptics tremendously. They have a high rate of supersensitivity. This is a guess, but this is one big explanation. In all the studies they people do, with it, which is comparing placebo towards um, medication, the placebo group is taken from people who were on medication before, who were withdrawn in two to five days, and they were called the placebo group. This is what we compare effectivity to. And I showed you that the, the rate of rebound and deterioration without the drug you took before, maybe for years, is high. So this is never counted in any placebo-controlled, randomized controlled trial. This is a provocation of the dosage. Here you see you have to stop dosing because it will, the, the results will not decrease, increase. And here is what you can choose for drugs in multiple episodes in, in this normal. You can go for 10 milligrams of aripiprazole. You can, this is the maximum dose you would need, 200 of amisulpride, 400 of clozoril, quetiapine, and risperidone 4. So we over-medicate people in the natural field already. But we start to do worse. We use higher dosages, and here you see what polypharmacy and higher dosages do to people. They have all these additional effects use if we use polypharmacy. We, we react to not less effectivity. We try to make it better, it doesn't work. I don't show these studies, but it's absolute scientific evidence that it doesn't work. Because I want to go into this brain, frontal brain <coughs> reduction, because it does something else to the brain. Because I spoke, spoke about the um, dopamine receptors, now I spoke about gray matter 
reduction. And here you see this big study done over more than a year with 629 people. And this is a meta-analysis and here you see the result. So if you use medication in the long term, it reduces the brain volume and the gray matter, which is the structure where the cells are. The effects are small to medium. Maybe some people have it more, some have it less. That many other subtle numbers count for this. Maybe they are more in the beginning and in the end. And we don't know what drug does what so far. So there are some kind of uncontrolled factors, but we could we have studies to control for substance abuse. This doesn't make it and age. So uh, now this is what they speculate. It's still a speculation. So they they reduce, and it's associated to the drug use. And it's the drug use which you use just. For in your whole life, the cumulative amount, not the daily. It's the same in first episodes, just shortly. Here you see they, the green ones are non-medicated, the red ones are medicated, and you see a strong effect after they started to be medicated less than a year. Strong reduction in certain centers of the brain. So these centers are important. They are for cognitive and emotional processes for executive functioning. And the insula is for sensory input, for kind of integration of what we get into our mind, emotion for information processes. So they are very key elements of higher functioning in our brain, which we influence by, uh, in, by um, neuroleptics. So clinical effects. We looked for this, uh, I was part of this study or review and we could see that most effects we do to the brain and which were clinically bad are on neurocognition. So these are attention, executive functioning, verbal learning. This is influenced negatively by this long-term gray matter reduction. Maybe some positive symptoms even, even get, get worse. There was one study, they get bot got better hallucinations, not many studies. So it's hard to, to make a conclusion out of that. But for neurocognition, it counts. Possible consequences. This is Mr. Mrs. Andreasen, lowest possible dose. At least this should be a normal message in psychiatry, which it should, be, should keep. The next is extend the dosages between the days. And I can't show the studies, guide people, um, Bob already mentioned the Wundering study, guide people into discontinuation. Help them, like what we'll all talk, talk. Don't let them alone as a professional. Help them to get out of the drugs, start soon, start slowly, and guide them. And a lot of knowledge is to gather, has to be gathered how to do this. And Last step, what Jaco already talked about, post and Birgitta, postpone the medication in first episodes. We don't know whether it works if they had pre-medicated before, but with first episodes, it should be a normal use, but you need contexts. You can't do it out of the blue. So how to postpone medication is through the need-adapted treatment open dialogue approach with all patient teams going into systems into, no, uh, into networks, into uh, normal, natural environments and help there. And or to use the Soteria model, which is even older, comes from the 70s and that is find a milieu, be with people in, in these states of mind and help them to get through. Okay, this, is, this works for 40%, 60 here, but intend to treat, there was a high dropout rate, 40, 25, that was not a good one, 40, 40. This is, if you put all the dropouts in, you might decrease the numbers, but in average we could succeed if we are good in 40% to do this. 
Jaco and Begitta were the first ones in the world and so far the only ones to get higher, up to 70%. Or in schizophrenia diagnosed people in 55%. So we have a spectrum of differences, 40% without, 40% with, how long we don't know, 10% maybe intermittent, and we have 15% non-responders. They don't do anything with drugs besides side effect. So don't give it. <laughs> you can find it out after a couple of months. And maybe you can read this. And when you read it, I would love Peter Götze to come over and take the last 10 minutes and to add something. But Peter, before, before you start, I just want to have a little, this is a guess now. Can, if you read this, can you imagine who said this? Lauren No, it's, it's more crazy. It's, it's a very ordinary, no, it's not an odd, but you know, he's in the middle of European psychiatry. Yeah. Thank you. 